I think that in fact it, it can be this, this shown that property in one form or another has existed always. Now, I want to draw the distinction between possession and property. Um, possession is actual physical ownership of something. Uh, property is illegal ownership. Aristotle defined the difference, uh, you know, 2,000 years ago, very simply. Property is something that you can sell. If you cannot sell it, it's not property, it's possession. So possession, in one form or another, physical possession, is very ancient <coughs> and held throughout the world. But property, the right to hold and to sell and to do with it whatever you want, is essentially a Western invention. You find that uh, possessiveness, the desire to hold on to things, to own things, is proper not only to human beings, but also to all, all living creatures. It was noted by an English ornithologist around the year 1900 that birds, which are very friendly to each other most of the year, in the spring become very hostile to each other. Why? Because that's the time when they were building their nests and while they're growing their, their offspring. Now, the fledglings are very sensitive and parents cannot fly very far away to gather food. They have to have an area around the tree where the nest is located to get food for their, for their offspring. And they become therefore very aggressive against the other animals, other birds. It has been noted, for example, when in the studies of deer, that when male deer fight, they don't fight for possession of females. They fight for possession of territory where they can graze. And female deer will not mate with males who don't, ha who don't have territory because their offspring will not have anything to eat. And this is throughout the animal world. I, I was told that even amoebas, which are the most primitive creatures of all, fight over territory. And I even see it in gardening. Well, if you have any experience in gardening, you notice that uh, plants are very uh, aggressive in trying to gain space and, and get, get to the sun and get, get, get sun and water. So possessiveness is, is, is universal throughout the living uh, world. Uh, but claims of ownership also have a very important psychological dimension. And nobody has explained this better than the Harvard professor, uh, William James, who died at Harvard about a century ago and wrote a famous a textbook of psychology. And this is what he wrote about the value of ownership and, and the human personality. I would like you to pay close attention to that. I'm quoting. The empirical self of each of us is all that he is tempted to call by the name of me. But it is clear that between what a man calls me and what he calls mine, the line is difficult to draw. We feel and act about certain things that ours, very much as we feel and act about ourselves. Our fame, our children, the work of our hands may be as dear to us as our bodies are and arouse the same feelings and the same acts of reprisal if attacked. In its widest possible sense, a man's self is the sum total of all that he, he can call his. Not only his body and his psychic powers, but his clothes and his house, his wife and his children, his ancestors and friends, his reputation and works, his lands and horses, his bank account. All these things give him the same emotions if they wax and prosper, he feels triumphant. If they dwindle and die away, he feels cast down. An instinctive impulse drives us to collect property, and the collections thus made become, with different degrees of intimacy, parts of our empirical selves. In every case of the loss of possession, there remains a sense of the shrinkage of our personality, a, a, a sense of the shrinkage of our personality, a partial conversion of ourselves, to nothingness." End of quotation. As far as I've been able to determine, there was no private property in land in Mesopotamia and Egypt. All the land that belonged to the, either the 
kings or to the temples. I think it first emerges in ancient Israel, even if it's conditional. Now we have the, the commandment, thou shalt not steal. That is, of course, an oblique way of saying respect property. We have um, injunctions against moving stones that separate fields. And there is this interesting story of King uh, Ahab, who had a uh, subject by the name of Naboth, who had a vineyard which King Ahab wanted to acquire. And Ahab wanted to buy it from Naboth, and Naboth wouldn't sell. He then tried to give him another vineyard to replace it. He wouldn't exchange. And so he finally gave up. But he had this horrible wife by the name of Jezebel. Uh, Jezebel, in, in our English language, is, represents the worst in, of female in, in womanhood. Jezebel told her husband, why don't you just get rid of this man? And he did. He had him killed. And he was suitably punished for that. So you have that in, in ancient Israel, but only in a very uh, 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 limited way. First of all, because it was usually not individual property, but family property. Secondly, because there was a law in ancient Israel, which I am told is not certain that it was ever exercised, namely that seven years times seven, that's 49 years, that's called jubilee year, the property was sold or acquired by somebody else had to be revert to the original owner. But nobody knows who was really um, exercised. Uh, certainly we have uh, private property in land in ancient Greece. <coughs> in Athens, you could not be a citizen if you did not own land. And you could not own land if you were not a citizen. And we have examples of uh, speculation in land. I have some very nice quotations in my book about that. Uh, how people speculate. So we one one uh, Greek historian saying that his father told him always to buy uh, undeveloped land because he could develop it and sell it at a good profit, whereas with developed land he couldn't do that. And then came, of course, Rome, which was heavily influenced by uh, ancient Greece. And in Rome, uh, Rome developed laws concerning property that exerted enormous influence on Europe. Um, virtually our, m most of our codes of private property descend from Roman laws. And you had a very important uh, distinction made in ancient Rome between uh, ownership and rule. Um, Seneca, the uh, stoic philosopher who lived in, uh, who lived in Rome, <coughs> coined the phrase, uh, kings rule, but subjects own. It's a fundamental distinction, which is, was unknown in ancient Mesopotamia and ancient Egypt in much of the world outside of Europe. And uh, as I will point out in a moment, it was not known in Russia, where kings both ruled and owned. Um, I, the, I would like to st uh, emphasize what I mean by, by the influence of property and, and the social and civil institutions <coughs> by comparing the evolution of two countries on the extreme ends of, of Europe. On the one hand, and the extreme west of Europe, England, and the other extreme East Russia. In England, law became private property already in the early Middle Ages. People already traded land in the 13th, 14th century. Um, the Norman kings who conquered England were supposed to pay for all their expenses, that is the court expenses, dispensation of justice, and armed forces, and so on, from the rents from their own properties. But by the early 14th century, they could no longer do that. It didn't, wasn't sufficient. So by 1300, they convened the, what became the House of Commons. And the reason they had to do that because they had to ask the owners of land, and they, most of the land was in private hands, to give them what we call taxes and they called subsidies. The kings had to go uh, convene the House, of, the House of Commons and say to the assembled member, Please give me so, so much money so I can run the court, I can run the armed forces, I can dispense justice. Now, what happened in England is that each year, the Parliament, the House of Commons, demanded more and more rights as compensation for the money which they gave to the government. And the government had to give them these rights. 
progressively. By the end of the 17th century, when you have the glorious revolution in England, uh, power already passes to a large extent to the House of Commons. By the year 1800, when England was engaged in a ferocious war with Napoleonic France, the King of England, George III, was declared formally insane. But it didn't matter. Uh, England fought the war very, very well and ultimately prevailed because it was the Prime Minister appointed by the House of Commons who uh, really ran the country. And uh, Edmund Burke very rightly said that English liberty was won by uh, taxation, by the control of taxes on the part of the population at large. Now, what do we see in Russia? In Russia, until about the uh, middle of the 13th century, um, there were private properties in land, and there were princes dependent on their, on their lords and so on. But then Russia was conquered by the Mongols around 1240. In the Mongol Empire, the Huns both ruled and owned, the very opposite of what Seneca said, that kings should rule, but the subjects should own. The, king, the Huns, as they were known, owned and ruled at the same time. And the Russians were subject to them. The Russians had to pay them tribute. And for about two and a half centuries, nearly two and a half centuries, they had no problem with their own. When they threw off the, what was known in Russia as the Tatar yoke, or the Mongol yoke, around uh, 1480, 1490, they adopted the Mongol custom that the Tsars and the, the rulers of Moscovy, who became the rulers of Russia, uh, owned the country and ruled it at the same time. That kind of a regime was defined by Max Weber, the German sociologist, as a patrimonial regime. And my book, Russian, the Old Regime, deals with the development of patrimonialism in Russia, the notion that everything uh, belonged essentially to the Tsars, to the, as of original, the, the, the uh, rulers of Muscovy, the princes of Moscow and eventually the Tsars by the 16th century. Now what does that mean? Unlike the English kings, the uh, rulers of Moscow did not have to convene parliament. Uh, they did convene something which looked like a parliament, was called the Land Assembly, the Empties of War, but mainly to ratify diplomatic actions and so on, never to assign them taxes. They didn't have to do that because they owned everything. They could impose any taxes they wanted. When Peter the Great came to the throne, he uh, uh, decided he, he, he composed a budget of what he needed and divided it by the number of uh, subjects he had and came out that each subject should, each male subject that is, had to pay something like 80 or 70 kopecks annually to ma enable him to rule. And he imposed the kind of tax. It was called the soul tax. And that existed in Russia actually to the end of the old regime. Only after 1906, when Russia got quite a constitution in the parliament, did that change. And for about 10 years, the Russian rulers, the Russian Tsars, had to go to, to the parliament to ask for taxes. But until then, uh, they didn't. Now, what's the result? In England, you had a high development of law, civil rights, and democracy ultimately. In Russia, you had no laws and no civil rights of any kind. The kings could do anything they wanted to any subject, not only commoners, but even the highest lords. They could have them beaten, they could have them decapitated, they could have them exiled to Siberia, and nobody could stop them. And the whole development of civil liberties in England and the lack of these civil liberties and laws in Russia was dependent on the existence in one country of private property and the absence of it in the other.